just going to read Isaiah 55. It says, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So you will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. And the mountains and hills will burst into song before you. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Instead of the thorn bush will grow the juniper. And instead of the briars, the myrtle will grow. This will be the Lord's renown, an everlasting sign that will endure forever. I just had this sense for this congregation this afternoon just a reminder that God is the God who transforms the wilderness into an abundant place of springs. Like that is his nature. That is who our God is. He transforms what was seen as too broken, too lost. And he restores and he redeems. And I just, I felt almost that what he wanted to do with us today was almost like a, a miniature kind of example of the bigger and wider narrative that he's doing in the world. I felt like he wanted to release joy in this space. As we remind ourselves that our God is the God who transforms, I just felt like he wanted to, to lift our eyes afresh and bring fresh joy. So Lord, I pray for anyone who feels right now like they're in a wilderness, that they're walking through um, a dry and parched land. Lord, I pray that you would bring the rhythm of your spirit. Jesus, I pray that you would renew and restore and refresh us. Lord, as we choose to enter into worship now, come and meet your people. Why don't you just choose to open yourself afresh? Like if that's what you're longing for today, choose to enter in as we worship now, to lift our voices, to lift our song to God, knowing that he is the God who meets with us, who draws close to us. So Jesus, we welcome you in this space. Let's enter into worship now. Try. 
of my sin was dead You knew I couldn't pay the debt You paid it with your final breath Oh hallelujah Hallelujah You took the wrath that I deserved every curse Her mercy had the final word Oh hallelujah Hallelujah We sing Christ and Christ crucified in you were raised from death to
Jesus, Jesus. I'll never stop saying your name, Jesus, Jesus. In every situation, it's Jesus, Jesus. Holy, holy 
Holy Spirit, come. The psalmist says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Lord, we, we want to taste your goodness as we gather today. We want to enjoy the blessing of community. We want to hear from your word. But our, our deepest desire is to encounter your presence. To feast at your table. So Holy Spirit, we ask that you'd come. Fill this place, fill each person with your presence. The, these truths of Scripture that we want to build our lives upon would become a living reality for us. The truth that your grace is actually sufficient. The truth that your peace passes all understanding. The truth that your power is made perfect in love. The truth that your perfect love does cast out all fear. But we want to live into these promises that they might become our daily realities, the spirit of the living God fall afresh upon us. moment we're going to say the Lord's Prayer. It's going to appear on the screen. But we're going to pray this prayer over our lives. We're going to pray this prayer over this city. We're going to pray this prayer over the nations. And particularly right now, we're going to pray this prayer over all that's happening in Israel and Palestine and the ongoing conflict. If our hearts are breaking, how much more must the heart of the Father be breaking? That our God doesn't stand at a distance looking on. He draws close to the brokenhearted. He is with those who are grieving. He's at work in the ruins, restoring, redeeming, establishing His kingdom. And with our prayers, we want to say, Lord, have mercy. Build your kingdom. So as we say the Lord's Prayer, I just want you to have that situation, maybe other global situations in mind. As we pray, Lord, just provide for their needs. All those who are suffering, feel like they're living in hell right now, would you give them like the daily bread they need? Lord, would you forgive sins, the violence that's just normal? Lord, forgive us. Would you deliver people from evil, from ill intent? So let's lift our voices as we say these words together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We're going to say that one more time and we're just going to turn the volume up just one notch. And we're going to pray from a deeper place, not just with our minds, but with our hearts. 
these are our brothers and sisters and we want to knock on the door of heaven. We want to pound the door of heaven. Like the parable Jesus told of the persistent widow, kept knocking, kept knocking until the door was open. That's how we're going to pray. So we're going to lift our voices for our brothers and sisters as we say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But deliver for the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, band. If you're new or visiting, um, massive welcome to you. I've done a sort of like baton change with Emma. So Emma welcomed you. My name's Pete. Together with my wife, B. We lead the church here at KXC. If I've not met you before, massive, massive welcome to KXC. Um, if you are new, there's a few things you can do. Just to find out more about KXC, we have regular newcomers meals. Um, the next one is coming up on the 5th of November, so fast approaching. It's an opportunity for my wife and I to share some of the story of KXC, welcome you into the family of KXC. If you've never been to one, even if you've been at KXC for a few weeks, a few months, if you've not been to a newcomer's meal, can I encourage you, sign up for the newcomer's meal, kxc.org.uk forward slash new. Um, also, at the end of service, head downstairs, stick around for a coffee, we'd love to say hi. And all details that, that you're going to find useful um, are on our website, kxc.org.uk. Becca, if you could just leave the door open. Um, we have an overflow room. So for those that didn't arrive on time, just note to self next Sunday, arrive on time. Um, they're in an overflow room. So in, I don't know if you can hear me in the overflow room. I presume you can. But can you just give a massive shout so we can hear those in the overflow room? <laughs> Tough crowd. They haven't found their voice there. But can we find our voice and shout and just say hello to those in the overflow room? Have they found their voices? That door open? <laughs> Let's try it again. Give us a shout if you're next door. <laughs> I'll work on it for next time. Um, anyway, great to have you next door. A few things to have on your radar. At the end of the 5 p.m. service today, um, we've got a prayer gathering, cultural diversity and celebration prayer evening. So we've had over a number of years, probably seven or eight years, a racial justice core team at KXC. Um, it's been renamed in the last few weeks, 7-9 which is from Revelation 7, 9, which is this vision of every tribe and tongue gathered around the lamb that was slain. Like we're going after a vision of radical diversity here at KXC, but we believe you only get radical diversity where there's radical unity around the person of Jesus, the lamb that was slain. And we've seen a wave of the Spirit do some incredible things um, in our church family, bringing about a greater measure of racial diversity, but there's so much more to come. We've just tasted a little bit and we want to keep contending for more. Greater measure of racial diversity, greater measure of cultural diversity. So at the end of the 5 p.m. service here in King's House, so that'll be roughly 6.30 p.m., and there's going to be a prayer gathering. And for those that have been part of this family and contending for this work over many years, I want to say a massive thank you for the contending. For those that are new, I want to invite you into that journey of prayer. And if you want to join us tonight, we'd love to see you. So that's roughly 6.30 p.m. here at King's House for the 7-9 prayer night. Um, also to let you know, there's a couple of roles that are opening up on the KXC team. Um, so if you go to the website, kxc.org.uk forward slash vacancies, the first one is community advocate. Um, you can find out more details on the website, basically working with some of our incredible partnerships, serving those that are vulnerable here in King's Cross, here in London. Um, so it's working in the local mission team. If you want to find out more, um, do ask us questions or head to the website. And the second one is the King's House community host. This is King's House. Downstairs throughout the week, we're hosting all sorts of partnerships, projects, ministries, and we're, we're wanting to do radical hospitality hospitality in that place. If that interests you, um, do come and chat to us, find out more, kxc.org.uk forward slash vacancies. Applications close on the 25th of October, so you need to move fairly fast. 
Final thing to let you know about is um, the KXC Big Quiz Nights. So this is basically a social opportunity where we gather as a church and have a huge amount of fun together. These are two quiz nights. They're exactly the same quiz. So do not rock up for night one, prep, take some notes, and then appear night two. We know who you are, and we have wardens that will kick you out of the venue, okay? Um, but do sign up for one of these. You can sign up on your own. You can sign up as a hub. Um, whoever you want to come with, come and we just have a, a kind of fun couple of evenings um, getting to know each other and building community. It's a big part of family life and it's a great opportunity to deepen and build friendships. So put the date in the diary and sign up. Come and join us for the, the big quiz nights. I think that is everything. As I said, any questions, any more info that you're looking for, head to the website kxc.org.uk. Brilliant. We're going to take a collection. This is an opportunity to give to what the Lord is doing here at, at KXC. We're going to say a little bit of liturgy together. Um, and then at the end, some details as to how you can give will appear on the screen. But let's say this liturgy that reminds us of, of why giving is part of our worship, part of our discipleship. So we say together, Lord, we give joyfully because you've held nothing back from us. Lord, we give generously because we want to become like you. Lord, we give sacrificially because we want others to taste the life of your kingdom. Father, receive these gifts and use them for your glory. Amen. So details as to how you can give will appear on the screen. There's also some baskets in the corner. You can um, put any cash in the envelopes. Head to the website kxc.org.uk forward slash give. One minute break. Find someone you don't know. Make a new friend. We're going to put a track on. Uh, one minute break. Okay, if you want to grab your seats, it is an absolute joy to have Tyler Staten with us this evening. If you're new, this is very normal for the congregation not to be listening, so don't let this stress you out absolute norm for us at KXC. But it is an absolute joy to have Tyler Staten from Bridgetown Church um, joining us this evening. Why don't we pray? That did the job. Um, brilliant. That very manipulative, but it does work. Um, it is an absolute joy to have Tyler in the house. Um, before I invite Tyler up, I'm going to read from John chapter 9. If you've got your Bibles, for all three of you that brought your Bibles to church, you might want to turn to to John chapter 9. Um, if you've got a smartphone with you, you might want to turn there too. We're going to be reading through the whole of chapter 9. So brace yourself, we're jumping right in, and then Tyler's going to unpack it for us. John chapter 9. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, Jesus said, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. After saying this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who'd formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked. I don't know, he said. 
Verse 13, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he's a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders, who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he's of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who'd been born blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they'd thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I've come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what? Are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. This is the word of the Lord. Um, let me invite Tyler up. Do you want to come and join me? Um, Tyler's a dear friend, as I said earlier. The, the church that he pastors in Bridgetown um, in Portland has become like extended family to KXC. So it is an absolute joy to have you with us. Why don't we give Tyler a huge round of applause? And let me pray, Holy Spirit, as, as we open up the scriptures again, hungry to learn from your word, would you speak to us in a way that opens the door to your kingdom and allows your kingdom purposes to come rushing in? We're so hungry. Please open our ears to hear your voice, open our eyes to see you. Amen. Amen. Once a very close friend of mine decided that it'd be beneficial to him to begin seeing a therapist. Uh, and that's a part of my story. I found therapy to be a really beneficial and important part of my own redemption journey that I'm still very much on. And I know I'm not entirely alone in that. I'm sure that many of you can identify. But the very first visit to your very first therapist or counselor can be quite daunting, but intimidating. So he asked if I would accompany him. And this particular therapist had no issue with this guy's pastor coming to the intake appointment with him. And so that's how I ended up sitting there next to my friend, a highly successful graduate degree educated young adult professional living in New York City as his therapist began asking him questions. 
Now, if you've ever been to therapy, you'll know that you come in with a presenting issue. My friend's presenting issue was that he seemed emotionally unavailable. He would get angry sometimes, but he couldn't remember the last time he had cried. And as he began to discuss this with his wife, he realized he, he thought it had been more than 20 years since he had shed a tear. And she said, you know, you might want to get that checked out. Uh, and so... He goes in with this presenting issue, but of course the presenting issue is never really why you're there. And the gifted counselor just kind of pokes and prods around in your inner world, uh, asking you questions until they find some pressure point that unravels you. And it's at that point that you find out why you're really there. So I'm sitting there praying quietly under my breath and listening as this therapist is asking questions. And this goes on for more than an hour. We're over our allotted time already. And then there's this one simple question that accesses a memory. And my friend, he begins to recount a story from when he was 11 or 12 years old. And he came home from school one afternoon. And he was sitting in the family living room. And he was on the computer. And he came across pornography for the first time in his life. And he didn't go on an internet deep dive or anything like that, but he did linger for a bit. And in that moment, his father, who was quite militant, walked into the room behind him, but he didn't see his father come in. And he was startled by, what are you doing? What are you doing? And at that point in the story, my friend didn't begin to cry. He began to wail to wail in this counselor's office. He fell from his chair onto his hands and knees on the floor, sobbing and wailing. And at this point, uh, he started to realize that all of the life that he was living, the emotional availability he had come in to deal with, the major decisions that he had made about school and vocation and spouse and so forth, his way of relating to others, even his view of himself, all of it was in some sense colored uh, by the shame that had plunged into his gut in that moment when he was 11 years old. A shame that had taken up residence in him. It was a pain that never healed, and so it told a story a story that defined him and a story that he was living. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? There's a lot behind that question. You see, at this time in Hebrew history, it was thought to be born with a disability uh, was a sign of a curse from God. And a curse this bad would only be given if there was some sort of egregious sin that was buried secretly beneath the surface. And so the blind were commonly excluded from the temple. It's quite possible that this investigation by the priest is the first time this man has ever stepped past the temple threshold. It's quite possible that it's the first time he's ever spoken to a priest in his life. This blind man would have grown up with people whispering questions about him. What's he done so egregious that God would strike him with an incurable curse? So to be blind was more than just a physical disability. It was that, but it was also uh, to be ostracized communally. And of course, that was tragically misguided logic, but it was equally common. And this man was an infant born with a disability, and that meant that he, along with his mother and his father, would be forever looked at with suspicion by the community. Oh, who is God cursing? Which one of you is hiding something? Which one of you is failing to uphold God's standard of covenant faithfulness? It meant that this man had likely been excluded from the holiday celebrations and the festive gatherings. It meant that he had been publicly shamed and seen as lesser, maybe even feared as a contaminant. It meant that he was almost certainly an embarrassment to his mother and father, an unfortunate blemish on their otherwise spotless family name. It meant that the family that was meant to nurture him and the friends that were meant to companion him, the village that was meant to raise him, the church that was meant to guide him, all of it became a source of pain, not of safety. Do you know what that feels like? When the mom or dad who are supposed to hold you and care for you and tell you that it's going to be okay, supposed to laugh with you and tuck you in at night and coach your football club, are the very people that disassociate from you instead? Or do you know what it feels like when a friend who is supposed to companion you hurts you instead? When you find out later what they said or have been saying about you when you weren't there to defend yourself? Or what they excluded you from, what they took from you, the way that they hurt you and the way that only someone you really let in has the power to hurt you? 
Or do you know what it feels like when the place you grew up, the hometown that you always thought you were supposed to love or turn to, becomes not uh, a landscape of nostalgia, but a graveyard of past pain? Do you know what it feels like when the church small group or the pastor or the priest, when the people of God hurt you or disappoint you in such a profound way that you can't even enter a building like this one without getting short of breath? So this blind man, he's suffering on two levels. He suffered from blindness, a physical disability, but he also suffered from shame, an inner invisible wound. Rabbi, who sinned? There's so much behind this question. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, what Jesus definitely doesn't mean by that is that God willed this man's disability. Sickness, suffering, and death were not a part of God's design in Eden, nor are they a part of God's redemption in the Garden City. They are consequences of the fall. When a lie leading to a deception culminated in a rebellion, sickness, suffering, and death break God's heart. And he's gone to unimaginable lengths to make a way toward renewal through them. So no, Jesus is not saying that God willed this man's disability so that he could work a magic trick on him sometime later in midlife. What Jesus does mean by this is that God does his deepest work in the very place of our deepest pain. That the shame in your story is not just a hole that is dug deeply into you that one day God will cover over with dirt and fill back in like it never happened. It's even better than that. He's saying that the shame in your story is the hole an imposter has dug into you and the place the imposter has dug deepest becomes the place God pours his love deepest. That the place that you have been hurt the most is the very place that God can reveal his love and grace to you the most. You see, I'm talking to you right now about your trauma. I'm talking to you about your negligent parents or your medical diagnosis. I'm talking to you about the night that you try to forget from college or the parental mistake that you made, the one that no one knows about but still replays in your mind sometimes as you're falling asleep at night. I'm talking to you about your mom's OCD or your father's insistence on living his unrequited dreams through you. I'm talking to you about the intimacy that you don't have, the companion that you don't have, the child that you don't have, the friendship that you don't have, the community that you don't have, and it haunts you. I'm talking to you about your trauma. That's the psychological term for it, at least. We love to reference moving quotes about wounded healers, but... My experience is that most of us still really struggle to believe that God really can do his deepest work in the place of my deepest pain. Trauma is a later 17th century word of Greek origin that literally means wound. Our English definitions define it a disordered psychic or behavioral state resulting from severe mental or emotional stress or physical injury. The author and therapist Risma Menachem defined trauma as a wordless story our body tells itself about what is safe and what is a threat. Putting all three of these together, author and pastor Rich Velotis defines trauma as the state of woundedness and the story that arises from living in that state. So trauma is not just being wounded, it is a story that arises from living wounded. Like a wound that you were born with and have never lived without, a wound that everyone else sees and defines you by. Like blindness that people assume is just the tip of the iceberg for what's really wrong with you. A wound that defines you before your family and defines you before your community and even defines you before your God, you're told. Or like your dad walking into the room in a compromising moment when you were 11. A wound that tells a story that defines you so subtly but so profoundly that you've never outrun it no matter who you've made yourself into and who you've become in everyone else's eyes. It's the shame that became a part of me. And trauma is so deadly not because we feel the pain all the time. Trauma is deadly because at some point we stop feeling the pain even while it's continuing to hurt us. We stop feeling it but it keeps damaging us. Dr. Paul Brand, a well-known physician who made a number of amazing discoveries and advancements in care of the terminally ill, argues from the perspective of the leprous that pain is a gift. 
You know, for example, if you were to be chatting with me in my home, and we're standing together in my kitchen, and as we were talking, I happened to lean my hand on, on the hot burner of the stove to rest my weight on it, I would immediately jump up and wave my hand. Why? Because uh, the nerve endings in my hand would be shooting pain signals from my hand to my brain saying, something is wrong, this is damaging you, move. But if I was... In a stage of advanced leprosy, I could lay my hand on that hot burner, and it would be damaging me, but the nerve endings in my hand have been damaged, so I don't even feel the pain. The damage is the exact same, but the alarm bells aren't going off that tells me, move your hand, this is hurting you. And that's what trauma does over time. We stop feeling the pain. The alarm bells stop sounding, and instead of jumping away from the pain, we lose the ability to recognize the pain altogether, even while it goes on damaging us. How have you been wounded? What are the violent or subtle ways that you have been hurt? And how have my wounds come to define me? What is the story that they are telling through my life? And am I able to recognize that pain or have I stopped feeling it? Even while it's damaging me. That's trauma. It's a wound that doesn't heal. And so it tells me through my life. It is a pain that I live from. So next Sunday, this church family is going to begin a journey together in a new teaching series on the supernatural ministry of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. And because that is the very good direction that you are headed together, I want to set the stage by looking at the two levels of healing that God works on within us. This blind man is suffering on two levels. He is suffering from blindness, a physical wound, but he's also suffering from trauma, a story that arises from living wounded. And we suffer on these same two levels. We suffer from physical wounds, but we also suffer from trauma, stories of woundedness. And we get a portrait of God shown to us here in John chapter 9, uh, that God is a healer on both of those levels. So I want to take a closer look at the story that we just read, and I want to chop it up into three chapters, which we will title The Healing, The Disruption, and the healing after the healing. All right? Chapter 1, the healing. Let's pick up right where we left off. After saying this, he spit on the ground and made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Jesus enters into this man's deepest pain with his deepest healing. Exactly where the imposter has dug deepest, Jesus pours his love fullest. The very part of this man's story that he most wanted to edit or erase or change somehow in his past becomes the very part of his story that he'll never stop telling because it's the place that God revealed his healing power most fully. Uh, The pain that I live from gets converted into the life that I live from. And all of that being true, and it absolutely is, it is very hard for us to read this particular story of healing without acknowledging the indisputable fact that of all the miracles Jesus ever worked, this is by far the grossest method. (laughs) Right? He (laughs) spits in the dirt, uses his saliva to make a couple eye patches of mud, places them on the man's eyes, and he sees. What is up with that? It's not quite as random as it might seem. Do you remember page one of the biblical story? Creation as God intended it, Eden. On page one, God creates everything simply by his breath. He speaks creation into being. Let there be light, and there's light. Let the water under the sky be gathered into one place, and the dry ground appears, and there's land and sea. Let the land produce vegetation, and there's magnolia trees, and wild ferns, and rose bushes. And it keeps on following this pattern the whole way through with one exception, when God makes people. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. So man and woman are set apart as the only aspect of creation bearing God's image. And God made us by a different method than he made everything else. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So how did God make people in his image? He scooped up some dirt, put his breath on it, and out came the fullest kind of life. 
And how did Jesus heal the man born blind? How did he recreate him in his image? He scooped up some dirt, put his breath on it, and out came the fullest kind of life. This isn't random. This is God's oldest trick. Jesus is recreating in this man exactly as God created it first. That's the healing of Jesus. It's to open your eyes to the Imago Dei that lives in you. It is to untangle the lies that you've believed and reverse the deception. When we imagine the miraculous healings of Jesus, this is usually where the story ends, right? A life that was once defined by the consequences of the fall becomes redefined in the glory of God. Beautiful. Yes, that's true, but it ignores a key chapter of every healing journey. Jesus has something really interesting right at the beginning of our story, something that I've just glossed over up to this point. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. The works of him who sent me. What is that? What is the work of God? It's creation. Remember what we see at the beginning. And we see Jesus using the same method to recreate in this man's body. Recreation. But recreation, the Father's work that Jesus is going about while there's light to do it, is about the healing of our bodies, but it's about more than just the healing of our bodies. It's also deeper than our bodies. It's about healing the visible and invisible wounds that we carry, healing the body and the soul, the outer and the inner world, the wounds on the surface that everyone sees and the deeper wounds that live beneath the surface that no one sees. So when Jesus opens the eyes of this man who was born blind, he isn't finished with his healing. He's just getting started. You see, Jesus is a miracle worker, and the Bible is a record of activity between creator and creation that absolutely insists on the miraculous. And the healing that we receive deepest is the slowest kind. Jesus heals this man's body. He opens his eyes in a matter of minutes, but his soul, all the big and small ways that he has lived from that wound, that's going to take a lot longer. And like all the most profound repair, it is going to look worse before it looks better. And that's what this next bit is about. Chapter 2, the disruption. I think maybe the most crucial observation that we can make from John chapter 9 is this, that healing did not fix this man's life. It didn't even necessarily improve this man's life. I mean, it improved his healing, or I'm sorry, it improved his eyesight significantly, Uh, But healing also introduced a whole new set of issues into his life. Now he's got new issues with community, new issues with authority, and new issues with family. We better take those one at a time. Yeah? New issues with community. I mean, first, his neighbors begin to question him. The people who'd gotten used to seeing him a certain way, defining him a certain way, suddenly have their paradigms turned on their heads, and skepticism comes more naturally than wonder does in moments like that. Like, who healed you? And are you 100% sure that you're all the way healed? How exactly did he do it? Where is he right now? That's a summary of the next five verses. When Jesus does something in the life of someone else that breaches my paradigms, that disrupts my view of reality and possibility, and it's threatening before it's thrilling to most, making healing both a celebration and a disruption for the one getting healed. We get used to things a certain way, and even if we don't like them that way, we at least can understand and accept them that way. And that upholds our illusion of control. But then when the way things are becomes the way things aren't necessarily, well, that can be threatening to us before it's exciting to us. Hence the questioning, the skepticism, and the resistance to wonder. Then this man's got even bigger new issues with authority. I mean, if the neighbors question him, the priests have launched a full-scale investigation. He's finally welcomed into the very temple that's ostracized him his entire life, but not to be restored to God's people, to be questioned by God's people. Because to celebrate this man's healing would be to admit that God has welcomed the one that we've excluded, that God has drawn near to the very one that we've drawn away from. Humility would be required for that, and that's a pill that gets lodged in the priest's throats. Another people group, another setting, but the same story. Healing is a disruption. It's a threat more than a thrill. And then finally, his biggest new issues come with his own family. Read again with me in verse 20. We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. 
His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Given the opportunity to defend their son, to restore their son, to celebrate their son, this man's mother and father don't do any of that. They grip onto their own social status instead. Fearing the very exclusion they've watched him wear all these years, they choose their own social inclusion over their child's family inclusion. He's of age, ask him. It's a devastating line. Healing is disruptive because their son's trauma was also their trauma. The trauma of being suspected of wrong so bad that it wounded your child with a permanent disability. Who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. The trauma of being embarrassed by the one you're predisposed to be proud of, of hiding away the face that you're supposed to obsessively show photos of. The trauma of socially distancing yourself from your own son while you pass by him quietly, of seeing him leaning like a vagabond against the city gate while you climb the steps right into the temple that he's not allowed to enter, of seeing him knowing that he can't see you in the midst of your own betrayal. You see, he... His healing means this family's got some work to do. And his eyes suddenly functioning doesn't fix any of that. Fixing all of that requires painful confessions and humble apologies and restorative conversations and time. So much time. I can see. I can see. It's a jaw-dropping miracle. And it's a show-stopping disruption. Both at the same time. Healing's not a fix. It's a disruption. And intuitively, we know that. And that's why I think some of us are reticent to do the work, to join God in the work of our own renewal. It's why we're hesitant to go on that silent retreat or hesitant to make that phone call, hesitant to book another appointment in that counselor's office. We live with some level of fear of our own healing because we're used to the version of shame that we live with, used to the version of dysfunction that we live with. We're used to the types of desires that we defer, and we're used to the coping mechanisms we use to keep other desires at bay. And if I let all of that out, if I give Jesus access to all of me, then sure, it might introduce a better possibility, but it introduces a whole bunch of mess. And I don't know what it feels like to live with that mess exposed. When Jesus approached this blind man in John 9, it was both a healing at the deepest level resulting in the fullest kind of life, and it was a disruption at the deepest level resulting in a whole new set of issues. It was both on the pages of Scripture, and it's both in our lives. Healing is a disruption of the deepest variety, and healing of the miraculous mud-in-your-eyes variety is quick, but healing of the deepest kind is slow. There's just no quick fix to the pain that's become a part of us, to the trauma that we live from. I once heard the psychologist Kurt Thompson point out that all that God makes in this world that is most undeniably beautiful also takes the longest to create. Right? Snowflakes are uniquely beautiful, but they're also incredibly fragile. All that it takes to destroy a snowflake is for the temperature to get above zero or for one footprint to step on top of it. But the Grand Canyon? The Swiss Alps? Joshua Tree? And that's beauty that took thousands of years to patiently form, and it's durable beauty. There is no change in temperature or season, and there's not a thousand footprints that can change that kind of beauty. It's beauty that was here before me, and it's beauty that's going to outlive me. It is beauty for generation after generation to behold, to gaze at, to wonder about the Creator with relentless commitment to create that same beauty within me, if I let Him. Durable beauty is the long, slow work of God, but when He's done, nothing can take it away. Not a change in the season of my life or the circumstances that surround me. Not a thousand footprints treading on his work in me. That's true for nature and it's true for us. Right, a new crush comes so fast. But an old couple hobbling down the sidewalk hand in hand, a lifelong marriage? Whew, that's slow. But it's durable beauty. 
And having kids can happen pretty fast, right? Like one night of passion and nine months later. But grandchildren, like that child of yours wanting to be known by you in adulthood, seeking you out for company and counsel, looking forward to being at your house for the holidays and wanting you to provide a shaping influence in their own children, whew, that takes time. But it's durable beauty. And new friendships, like hitting it off with someone, grabbing a cup of coffee, discovering you've got some shared interests and a similarity and sense of humor, I mean, that can happen this evening. But church, the, the sort of community that lasts through disagreement and dysfunction, that sees the worst in you and still chooses to be around you, that, that's not just your interests and humor, but knows about your fears and desires and struggles and gifts and guilt and failures. Church, my friends, takes time. But there's durability to, the commun- to that kind of community. It is so durable, in fact, it lasts in this age and into the age to come. Do you see what I'm saying? It's durable beauty. And the same creator who makes durable beauty out of the dust is relentless in his commitment to make that same durable beauty out of you and me. Will you let him? I'm bringing all this up to both comfort and to challenge you. I I want to assure you that if you're seeking healing and it's taking a long time, If if the deepest wounds in your life, the trauma that you live from is just hanging around stubbornly, no matter how many times you dismiss it, and the image of God that was put in you at first seems always late to the party, no matter how many times you invite it to come, it's not because the prayer isn't working or the community isn't working or the counseling isn't working or some combination of all those factors isn't working. It's because slow, durable beauty takes time, and God is a patient artist when it comes to his masterpieces, and that is who you are. And I also say it to challenge you with a question that Jesus posed to a man 38 years into identifying with his pain. Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Or do you just want to stop feeling pain? Because there's a difference. Do you want the symptoms removed or do you want to become the image bearer that he made you to be? Do you want him to create within you a brief moment of snowflake beauty? Or do you want to be the Swiss Alps kind of beauty, the slow but durable, lasting variety? Maybe the best way to say it is, are you willing to believe that God has not forgotten the first two pages of the Bible? That he remembers Eden, that he has never lost sight of the person that he formed you into being when he knit you together in your mother's womb? Are you willing to bear to believe that he is relentless in power to recreate and equally unrelenting in patience to restore every last cell of your being? That he will never stop drawing his image to the surface of your life? That dignity is even more original than sin? And that he will never stop doing the work of the Father while there's still light to do it? Healing is an extraordinary miracle. And healing is a slow, long disruption. And that's why Jesus didn't skip town after he opened this man's eyes. He stuck around for chapter 3, for the healing after the healing. John chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, wait, I got to stop right there for a second, because this is what makes the disruptive healing of Jesus worth it, is that When we feel the disruption that healing throws us into, Jesus doesn't leave us there on our own. He comes and finds us again in the midst of the disruption. It's Philippians 1. He who began a good work and you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It's Hebrews chapter 12. Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter, meaning completer, finisher of our faith. And one chapter later, we're reminded of one of his most ancient promises. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. Jesus is not going to leave you half healed, waiting endlessly in the disruption. He is coming after you. He comes and finds us to do what? To restore our identity. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus does not promise us escape from the disruption. He promises us his presence in the midst of the disruption. You see, healing 
acquainted this man with God's power, the healing after the healing, Jesus coming and finding him in the midst of the disruption that healing threw him into, that acquainted him with God's person. And we can survive, we can even thrive in the midst of the storms that that the healing process of God throws us into when we realize that his presence will always be with us in the storm. And when we recover God's identity, something amazing happens. We recover our own as well. When we see God as he really is, a victorious healer who his commitment to me is so fierce that he will not only redeem my pain, but he will come and find me again after the healing to complete the work, to finish what he started. When we see God as he really is, then we discover ourselves as we really are in his image. I got three little boys, Hank, Simon, and Amos, seven, five, and one. And when I'm tucking them in at night, I always pray pretty much the same prayer. And it's not out of habit. It's because I mean it again every single night when I'm tucking them in. And it's always some version of, God, thank you so much that I get to be Hank's dad. I mean, you could have chosen anyone. And I get to be Hank's dad. I get to sit on the front row of the ups and downs of his everyday life. I'm so glad that I get to be Hank's dad. And recently when I was praying that prayer, something hit me that that, that's the image of God praying from within me. That the song that is sung over me in heaven sounds something like, I'm so glad I get to be Tyler's God. Could have been anybody. But I get to be Tyler's God. I get to sit on the front row and watch the ups and downs of his redemption journey. What is that? Is that just like some millennial narcissism cloaked in spirituality? I don't think it is. I think it's the beaming voice of the Father over Jesus' baptism. You're my son, whom I love. With you, I'm well pleased. Galatians 3 says that I am clothed in Christ, that when the Father sees me, he sees that same beaming image glowing from within me. You see, when we recover identity, God's and then ours, the prayers that begin to come out of us, they just start sounding like, one thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple all the days of my life, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. You know, we're not used to dwelling much of anywhere these days. The modern estimate is that the average American will work 40 different jobs by the time they reach retirement or death. Our phones, our social media profiles, our career mobility, which isn't really a choice these days. It's more like a necessity for a competitive resume. All this and more is conspiring to train us to be wandering, distracted, Uh, to live always on the move, to never dwell, and that is a problem for the state of our souls. Because Jesus says, remain in me. And David prayed, this is my one ambition, it's my one request, that I may dwell, that I may remain in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Healing is found deepest by those who learn to live daily at home and at work and at parenting and in marriage and in friendship when I'm alone and when I'm surrounded. Those who learn to live dwelling in God's presence. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. To gaze is not to glance. To gaze is not occasionally to meet eyes with. To gaze is not to look up from time to time to ensure that God and I are still in the room together. To gaze is to unflinchingly fix my face on his face. It is awkward even until I push through the awkwardness to see him seeing me and loving me. And to seek him in his temple. You know, the temple of the Lord is not an isolated place. It's a communal one. The way Jesus comes to find us again and again in this slow, disruptive process of healing is primarily through other people. And sure, some of those people can be therapists and counselors, absolutely, but some of those people are his other children. Because when we dwell in the house of the Lord, we do not dwell alone. Uh, We have one father and many children. He's adopted a whole bunch of us into one family, and we come into that house all dwelling together. So who are the three trusted people in this church family that could tell me everything about you? Like your home and your favorite food and the names of your children and your parents. 
and your strengths and weaknesses and spiritual gifts and your destructive patterns, your greatest fear and your deeper des- deepest desire, the theme of God's redemption within you at the moment and the prayer that you've lost the strength to keep praying because you've waited on it so long. Or the last time that you looked at pornography and the hidden issue you have with your diet and the way that you sometimes uh, sneak an extra drink when no one else is looking so the others don't know how much you've had. Who are the three people in this community that you have led in so deeply that they can come and find you as Christ in the healing after the healing? Because the primary way he makes his appeal to us is through other people. Remember what Jesus said. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Jesus didn't say I, he said we. And he's talking to his disciples. We do the works of the Father. He is enlisting us in his most precious work. The healing that you and I need deepest cannot be experienced just between me and Jesus, or even just between me, Jesus, and a trusted professional. Those are good contexts, and I am all for them. But the primary way that Jesus comes to find us and to heal us deepest is in community through people. That's what it means to seek him in his temple. And so we'll land with this. At the conclusion of John's gospel, meaning the end of the book that we've been reading from the middle of, Jesus begins to promise us his spirit. And he says, I'm going to send you my spirit. It's even an improvement on my physical presence with you. And Jesus says the Holy Spirit has a few names, advocate, comforter, and counselor. You know, most doctors, they do healing through prescriptions, right? A pill that you can take to recover, a quick and sure method of healing. And Jesus is the great physician. He writes prescriptions and he heals in a miraculous, supernatural, instantaneous way. The deepest kind of healing, though, not the healing of our wounds, but the healing of the stories our wounds tell through our lives, that takes a healer of a different kind who uses an entirely different method. The Holy Spirit is called Advocate comforter and counselor and counselors heal slowly not quickly they don't write prescriptions they ask questions questions that unravel you that you might be put back together remade we all come in with a presenting issue right every patient who knocks on the door of every counselor every disciple who knocks on the door of the great counselor And it seems to me that Jesus has always done his deepest healing, not through prescriptions, but through questions. You know, the resurrected Jesus, filled with supernatural power to make appearances wherever he wanted to, to walk through walls. He shows up to his disciples in the disruption that his crucifixion threw them into. He comes and finds them in the healing after the healing. And he just poses simple questions. Simple questions that unravel them, that target the place of their deepest pain so that he might reveal himself right within it with them. It was Mary Magdalene in the garden outside of his tomb. Woman, why are you crying? A question that targets her grief that she might articulate it to him only to recognize him there with her in the midst of her grief. And then there was those two disillusioned disciples who were hanging their heads and walking along the road to Emmaus and Jesus Uh, walks up next to them and says, what are you discussing together as you're walking along? A question that prompts them to begin to recount the promises of God, the very promises that seem so far away now, the promises that they've given up on in this change of season and circumstance that surrounds them. And as they begin to articulate the promise, something happens, their hearts start to burn within them again. And then they even recognize that he is there with them, walking away from him in the midst of their disappointment. And then, of course, there's Peter. Right, The rock that the church was meant to be built on revealed as a public catastrophic failure in the defining moment. And then Jesus showed up on a beach where Peter was fishing to ask a question. Do you love me? It's a question that is pinpointing his loyalty, the very source of his shame ever since that denial in the courtyard. And as he becomes conscious of that shame, as he feels it as hot again as he did a few days ago, Jesus says, in essence, and you're still the rock that I want to build the church on. We all come in with presenting issues, right? Everyone who knocks on the door of every counselor's office and everyone who knocks on the door of the office of the great counselor, we show up thinking it's a predictable and declarative God we want. 
We want a prescription to provide the quickest kind of healing, but of course it is questions that heal us deepest. He breaks us apart that he might put us back together, remake us in his image. And so I just want to ask you one more time. Do you want to get well? Why don't we stand and pray together? Would you come, Holy Spirit? Pete, why don't you come lead us into response? Would you come, Holy Spirit? I just want to invite you just for a moment to linger. If you're happy to do this, just to close your eyes, just to put aside distractions. And if you're willing to open up your hands, simple posture of getting ready to receive a gift. How much more will the Father give the Spirit to those that ask? That's what Jesus said. Holy Spirit, fall afresh upon us. Let's just allow the spirit, the comforter, the counselor to gently knock on the door of our hearts with these simple questions. Where does it hurt? Do you want to get well? And if the answer is yes, then just give full permission for the spirit to come and do what the spirit wants to do where the spirit of the Lord is there is liberty there's freedom there's healing Holy Spirit come In a moment, I'm going to invite some people to the front as we'd love to pray for you. If, as Tyler was preaching, as we were unpacking John chapter 9, as the Spirit was just moving, if, if you know there's a place of wounding and there's a story you've been living in as a, a result of that wounding, and, and you just know the Spirit saying, do you want to get well? Inviting you to take the next step on that slow, deep journey towards restoration at soul level. If, if you know there's that kind of invitation and, and you want to say yes to it, then we want to be responsive to that and we want to pray for folk. So I just want to invite you to do a really brave thing. It's just to push out of the rows and come and stand at the front if you know that's you. Wherever you are, if you know that you want to step further in to this deep work of restoration, don't wait for another Sunday thinking, I'll do it another time. You probably won't. The Spirit is here now. He's knocking on the door now. Let's be responsive to that. That's it. And then we're... We're going to invite some people to pray for folk at the front. But in a moment, as I invite people to come and pray, as you, as you find someone to pray, I, I want to invite you just to place a hand on their shoulder to say a simple ancient prayer, come Holy Spirit, and then just bless what the Father's doing. The Spirit's moving. You don't need to orchestrate anything. So when you pray for them, don't bombard them with your best prayers. Don't like ram scripture down their throats. Just allow the Spirit to do a deep restorative work at a soul level. 
So if we can have a second wave of people to come and pray for folk at the front, we're going to need quite a few prayers. If you love Jesus and you're part of our family, you are welcome to come and pray. And my encouragement is I want everyone that's been bold, who's come to the front and stepped forward to receive prayer, let's not leave anyone standing alone. If there's someone at the front not being prayed for, that should be the tap on your shoulder of like, I'm needed to pray this evening. Holy Spirit, come. Thank you for those moments of just instant healing, supernatural, inbreaking of the kingdom. We thank you for those moments. But Lord, we're so grateful that you do the slow, deep work of the restoration of our souls. You heal our wounds, but you also bring restoration to the false narratives that have held us captive. So Spirit, come and do your deep work. We're going to need more prayers. So this is just a pitch. If you love Jesus, have a pulse. I'm talking to you and you're part of our family. Could you come and pray? There's a number of women at the front that need someone to come and pray with them. Spirit, come. In these verses, John 14 onwards, which are about the gift of the Spirit, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. You don't have to walk this healing journey alone. I'll be by your side. I will slowly walk you through the dark valleys into green pastures by still waters where your innermost being comes alive in my presence. Still need a few more prayers. If you're on the live stream, I just want to encourage you just to take a moment to allow the Spirit to minister to your innermost being. Just where, wherever you're watching this from, at home, on the tube, later in the week, may the Spirit of the living God rest upon you and minister to your innermost being. So if you're on the live stream, we're going to say goodbye. Have a great week. But if you're in the room, let's just continue to linger.